Alleluia, alleluia. Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. When the time came for purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And the sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asia. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord May I speak in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we have travelled the journey of Epiphany. We've heard the stories, we've heard the miracles, we've heard the happenings that are related to us each and every year in this time. Perhaps you've also noticed as we've read through these stories that we have heard Jesus being called many things, being given many different names. Messiah, son of David, son of God, word made flesh, savior, light of the world. Well, today we come to the end of this season. And having heard this morning's readings, 
I want us to consider two of those named to Jesus. In our first reading from the letter to the Hebrews, we heard about Jesus as Saviour, perhaps not by name as Saviour, but by description as Saviour, destroying the one who has the power of death and freeing those who were held in slavery. And in our gospel reading, we hear about Jesus as the light of the world. Or perhaps more specifically, in the words of Simeon, the light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. It is, of course, no accident that these two readings and these two names for Jesus come together in this day. Jesus, as light of the world, is revealed through his nativity and his epiphany. And Jesus, as saviour, is revealed through his death, resurrection. And today these things come together. Today the season of Christmas and Epiphany comes to an end. Today we will put the crib back into storage until we're ready to celebrate the Nativity again next year. And as we leave this season behind us, we begin the journey that takes us into Lent, Passiontide and Easter. In the words that we will say in our final responsory at the end of today's service, we turn now from Christ's birth to his passion. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it than just turning our attention from the Brussels sprouts of Christmas to the chocolate eggs of Easter. I'm sure if you ask my children, they'll tell you the chocolate eggs are far more exciting than the Brussels sprouts. But to get under the skin of what it means to turn from the crib to the cross, it helps us to consider these two names of Jesus. We heard in our gospel reading Jesus being brought to Jerusalem 40 days after his birth for the rite of purification, as was required by the law. And while they were there in the temple in Jerusalem, Mary, Joseph and Jesus met Simeon the righteous and devout man who was looking forward to the consolation of Israel and on whom the Holy Spirit rested. In one sense, Simeon was the one who had everything to lose in this encounter. He had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not taste death until he had seen the Messiah. Well, having seen Jesus, his life could now come to an end. Having recognised the baby in his arms, he knew he had nothing more to live for. But instead of resentment, Simeon was guided by the Spirit as he took Jesus in his arms. He did what was required by the law, and then he praised God in that wonderful song of praise that we heard. It was in this song that the message of the angels the Magi, John the Baptist, and all who we've travelled with through this season of Christmas and Epiphany was completed and made whole. Simeon gave up his life to God, a life that was made complete by holding Jesus in his arms. And he went on to identify Jesus as the light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. This was the point, perhaps, at which the fullness of Jesus' future was revealed to his mother as she stood and she listened. Not simply the Messiah, come to save the Jews from Roman rule, but the light for the Gentiles as well, the light of the world. Jesus' message of love and inclusivity begins here, spoken by the prophet, and still said or sung in churches every day of the year, at evening prayer, evensong, or compline. But we're not there yet. Simeon goes even further. He addresses Mary directly, and he tells her that this child is destined for the falling and rising of many and that he will be opposed. We still see this in our world today. People grow in their relationships with Jesus. 
People fall from their relationships with Jesus. People persecute those who have faith in Jesus. But for all who turn to Jesus and have that faith, he is their light and their salvation. Jesus, light of the world. Jesus, saviour. The symbol of light is one that's used in many situations and has been ever since. As we come to the end of our service today, we will all light candles as we commit ourselves to turning from Christ's birth to passion. As our baptism in the service is led from the front, we will be in the shadow of the first symbol of Jesus' new life in his resurrection, the Paschal candle, the new light lit at the Easter Vigil every year, bringing that light of Christ out of the bonfire of destruction. Taking the symbol of light further behind me, a light burns constantly to symbolize that Jesus' body is reserved. The communion bread in which we share, reserved for the sick and the dying, sharing this same symbol of light. Through this light, Jesus has revealed to the Gentiles the glory of Israel, the light of the world. But today we begin a new journey with this light. As I've said already, and I promise you I will say it again, we turn today from Christ's birth to his passion. We begin to prepare to share in what it means for that light, that light behind me, to be put out on Good Friday, knowing that Jesus had died. Readiness, there in the Easter joy of the light that stays lit forever. And in doing this, we bring in the second name of Jesus, Jesus as Saviour. Everything I've said so far makes a certain amount of sense. Even to those who don't believe, they will recognise the symbolism. They can understand why it matters to those of us who do. But Jesus as saviour is a slightly harder concept. The obvious question being, of course, what exactly does Jesus save us from? For someone who's not a believer, it's not illogical to ask why Jesus doesn't save us from suffering, from dying, from hunger, from the pain of losing friends and family. I say this because this is exactly the conversation starter that I was offered by somebody I spoke to this week whose mother had recently died and who was very, very angry with Jesus. It is a very good question. Jesus, during his ministry, did save people from these things. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he brought friends and family back to life. And so it's very difficult when someone is angry because Jesus doesn't bring their loved one back from the dead. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews perhaps helps us in our first reading today and makes it very clear that we are being saved, makes it very clear, sorry, what we are being saved from in the passage that we heard this morning. Jesus was made man, shared in our existence, so that he could save us from the enemy who he overcame on the cross. The enemy of sin, death, and the devil. During his death, our symptoms, through his cross resurrection, he is ready to save from within. During his time on earth, people were drawn to Jesus because he could heal them. People followed him because he inspired them. People loved him because he loved them. Through his cross and resurrection, he heals, inspires and loves not just our physical selves, but our very beings. He sees us far deeper than just as flesh and bones and is ready to discard those that bring us back to himself as pure and holy. On the cross, Jesus pays the price for all sin. 
If we come to him in true repentance, we will be forgiven because of the cross. In his resurrection, Jesus overcomes death, showing that it is not the end and that there is life still to come and hope of everlasting life. And in his birth, ministry, life, and he exposes the powers of evil. About the power of the evil one, about the trials, he overcomes temptation, and he gives us an alternative. We are saved from sin, death, and the devil because Jesus is light, and that light leads us to the eternal life which he has ready for all who turn to him. Isn't a foregone conclusion. He is also destined to see many rise and fall. But for those who carry his light into the world, he is that light. And so as we turn today from Christ's birth to his passion, we do see the light of Jesus Christ, who on the cross makes the sacrifice that gives us the confidence to be here and to turn to him and with him. Jesus, light of the world. Jesus, Saviour. Let us turn from the crib to the cross, from Christ's birth to his passion. And let us pray this morning that we may walk in the light of Christ, who loves us, cares for us, protects us and saves us. Amen.